I'm uh, Lant Pritchett. I've been a professor of development economics, and what I want to talk about today is new ideas about how to expand, extend, and build state capability. And I want to start with a little story. Well, I want to start with facts about state capability. If we look around the world, the world is changing very rapidly in very many ways. There's rapid scientific progress in a number of fields. There's rapid, obviously, changes in information technology. Many countries are experiencing rapid economic growth. But if you look at the measures of the capability of the state to carry out its functions, there seems to be something like the big stuck. Lots of countries are making little or no progress in the capability of their organizations to accomplish the functions that they set out to do, whether it's educate children adequately, whether it's run a fair and equitable and effective health system, where, whether it's enforce rule of law, whether it's achieve reductions in the environmental damage through environmental regulation, the capability of those organizations to contribute to successful outcomes seems to be stagnating. So one of the key constraints to improving human well-being around the world, and especially perhaps in India, is the capability of the state. Now, the fact that there's a big stuck and that most countries on the standard measures of state capability have been at roughly the same level for over 20 years suggests that the existing techniques to build capability have some fundamental flaws. If you've been trying things and you haven't been making progress, sooner or later you have to ask yourself the question, maybe what I'm doing is flawed in some not surface way, but a deep way, that I'm trying to do the wrong thing. So let me tell a funny story. <laughs> a friend of mine told me this story, and so it's true in the way true stories are true. Uh, he had a good friend who was getting married and his new bride had a beloved cat, Duke. And the beloved cat, Duke, had been the wives and had come into the marriage. And she was nervous about going on any honeymoon unless Duke was adequately cared for. So he agreed that he would go do his friend the favor of taking care of Duke for the week. And his friend warned him that the cat, Duke, was very, <laughs> not very human friendly, as cats sometimes are, and that he probably wouldn't warm up to him and Duke wouldn't be nice to him, but it'd be a big favor if he took care of Duke. So my friend agreed to do it. He flew out to Los Angeles where his friends lived, and they had left on their honeymoon. He had a key to the house. He opened the door to the house, <clears throat> and as he opened the door, boom, Duke ran out the door. Day one, second one, <laughs> mission to care for Duke has gone awry. He spends hours going around the neighborhood calling Duke nothing. So finally, it's late. He says, I, I can't, nothing more I can do. I'm just going to go to bed. He goes to bed. He wakes up in the morning. He opens the door and in trots Duke. Like, whew, crisis averted. And then during the rest of the week, he takes good care of Duke and and it turns out Duke is a really friendly cat and warms up to him and will snuggle with him while they watch TV at night. And so then he takes care of Duke. He leaves before his friends arrive back from their honeymoon, leaves Duke safely in the, in the house, flies back, and um, <clears throat> his friend gets back from the honeymoon and, and uh, he friend calls and says, oh, uh, how did it go? And he says, well, you were wrong about Duke. Duke was a very friendly cat. We had a great time together. And he says, well, I, I really appreciate you taking care of that cat. Unfortunately, that cat is not Duke. <laughs> so one cat had wandered out and another cat had wandered in and he spent a week doing his friend an enormous favor, but there was just one flaw in the plan. He had the wrong cat. So one of the things we should think about is if we've been unsuccessful <laughs> in promoting state capability, maybe there's some deep flaw in the way we've been going about it, and you only have to be wrong about one thing for all of your effort to be unproductive. So all of his cat-taking effort was sincere, dedicated, well-meaning effort, 
but it all failed on the very first second of not taking care of the right cat. So I want to talk about wh where we might be making a mistake that is perpetuating the big stuck. And the first thing I want to distinguish is what we mean, what I mean when I say state capability. Uh, and I want to in particular distinguish this from capacity of individuals, right? So for instance, <clears throat> the US Army has musical groups. And the US Army being the US Army, therefore has flautists who are career US Army personnel. And they have trombonists who are career US Army personnel. So they have to have standards of performance. So there is a US Army certified certification of the capacities of flautists. And you know, it has specified criteria and to get promoted as a flautist, you have to perfect your capacities as a flautist. And that is what I mean by individual capacity. It's what the flautist can do. But what we're really concerned about is what does the orchestra or band sound like when they cooperate? And the cooperation is the capability of the band. And sometimes the capability of the band is limited by the capacity or quality of the players. But sometimes the capability of the band is limited by the way in which it's organized, by the way in which they cooperate. And so the capability of the band could be much, uh, <laughs> it could be that the capacity of the individuals isn't the limiting factor in the capability of the band. I think this is the important concept for um, India because there's a recent excellent study that looked at the quality of health care that people in rural Madhya Pradesh received from their first care providers. So they surveyed people, they said, when you're sick, who do you go see? Some of them went to see the druggist, some of them went to see a quack, some of them went to see an MBBS doctor, some of them went to see a variety of places. And then they did, once they had identified the providers, they did a, what's called a mystery shopper. So they sent someone in <laughs> to report to this provider some symptom and then was trained to answer questions if the, if the healthcare provider asked them questions, diagnostic questions, they were trained to know how to answer them. And then they kept track of what the provider actually did. The upshot of this was that <laughs> it turns out the worst medical care in rural Madhya Pradesh and the best medical care in rural Madhya Pradesh were exactly the same people. If you went to see an MBBS doctor in their PHC clinic hours, you actually got the worst care. Worse than the quacks, worse than the druggists, worse than the uncertified private sector. If you went to see those same doctors in their off, in their private sector practices in the evening, they actually exercised their true capacities and were the best medical care in rural Madhya Pradesh. So that, I'm not claiming that is true as a general thing of all of India or all of medical care. The general point, the conceptual point though is, the quality of medical care provided in the primary health care centers in Madhya Pradesh was not constrained by the capacity of the individuals to diagnose and treat medical conditions. It wasn't a capacity problem. It was the way in which those individuals embedded their efforts into an organizational structure led to low capacity, low capability. I'm sorry, that's the distinction I'm trying to make. Low capability of the organization in spite of embedding high capacity individuals into it. So the first thing I want to stress is that when we're talking about building the capability of organizations to carry out functions, we want to start with a key distinction of, do we think that the primary constraint to better organizational capability is individual capacity, in which case one set of actions is the obvious remedy, which is training people to build their individual skills and competencies, 
But if you already have people with the potential skills, but aren't exercising them in the organizational context, then you have to think of a whole nother strategy. So that's the first kind of important point. The second, I think, key point to understanding building organizational capacity, again, capability, particularly, I feel, in India, is <clears throat> you have to distinguish types of capability. If I were to show up to a physical trainer um, at a health club, uh, <laughs> Uh, first of all, by looking at me, you know they would be surprised to see me. Oh, well, okay. Um, but, and I said, I want to build my athletic capability. Their first question should be, what is it that you want to do? If I want to play tennis, then I need agility, I need quickness, I need a quick acceleration, I need hand-eye coordination, I need core strength. If I want to be a weightlifter, all of that's kind of irrelevant. I just need one lift maximums and I need to build big bulky muscles. And so the way in which I go about building cap capability has to be tailored to the function, the athletic function I want to carry out. So I want to make a, a distinction that we've made in other research and I'm going to go to the whiteboard and sort of draw um, three categories of functions that the state carries out. Um, and I think one of the challenges facing capability building in India is a lot of the capability building is premised on a mistaken notion of the actual capability that's needed. So if you think about <coughs> things that the state does, some of those things <coughs> <laughs> we call policy making. These are experts designing programs, designing uh, uh, policies that they think, if implemented with fidelity, will lead to better um, outcomes. And sometimes they're making decisions, right? So policy making, often involves relatively few people, so it's not transaction intensive. It doesn't take 100,000 people <laughs> to make good policy at the Reserve Bank of India. It really takes a few hundred supporting and a few dozen really people with expert judgment. So policy making we cr classify as being non-transaction intensive. So if we're building capability for policy making, we want to focus on building really good expert judgment at a highest level of relatively few people. And that would build the capability. The second kind of thing governments often do is what we call <laughs> in our classification scheme logistics. What characterizes logistics is to successfully carry out logistical functions. They are transaction intensive. You need lots of people, and I'm just going to abbreviate that TI, transaction intensive. You need lots of people to cooperate. But the beauty is, is they don't require what we call local discretion. It doesn't require that the agents responsible for implementation actually make sophisticated judgments that are hard to make and they don't make judgments that are hard for others to observe. So the post office delivers the mail. Everything about how each person in the chain of the post office should treat a package is completely encapsulated in narrow information of the postal code. The information, the class of service, there's no, no one cares that inside this package is cookies lovely baked by a grandmother or something. They don't care. It's, we're going to follow an algorithm and the post office is a marvel. <laughs> a functioning post office is absolutely a terrific improvement in the history of human affairs. The fact that we can cooperate at large scale and communicate people, communicate with people around the world was a huge 
enormously productive innovation. And so, government doing logistics has a certain logic to the way in which you would build capability to do logistics in which you would emphasize to your agents process compliance. If you just do exactly what the script tells you to do in the sequence that we have designed for the organization so each person follows their script, the whole organization has high capability with each individual's contribution kind of very regimented, very, and all they have to do is process compliance, right? And so you might build the capability for process compliance. The challenge is <laughs> there are activities that the government wants to carry out and every government does engage in that are both transaction intensive require lots and lots of people to cooperate in bringing to successful collusion and they involve agents making local discretionary decisions that are hard for the organization or others to observe whether they're doing the right thing. So ambulatory curative care is transaction intensive. There's a clinic and somebody pitches up at the clinic and they say, Doctor, <laughs> my, you know, it's been hurting right here for the, you know, last two days. And then the responsibility of the agent is to determine what's appropriate to do for that person. But that requires expert judgment that responds to the specific context in ways that aren't necessarily predictable, aren't necessarily scripted. And they require people to use judgment. And moreover, they often require people to use concern and care in ways that are very difficult to script. And hence, it's very difficult <laughs> in a distributed context with people whether or not what was done at the time was right or wrong, was the best thing or not. Um, so for instance, the police are thrown into chaotic situations often. There's some potential law and order challenge, and their task is to bring it under control and avoid terrible outcomes often. That's an incredibly subtle task. That's, that, that's not, I can't script. You show up and two people are fighting, what do I do? It's a thing that requires human judgment in the context. So the big, and so lots of things and this is what we just call implementation intensive. And what we mean by that is exactly implementation intensive. What we mean by that is producing organizational capability requires that lots of agents, not a few elites, carry out actions in their day-to-day -day activity that pursue the objective of the organization effectively that can't be reduced to a narrow script, right? So teachers, teachers, um, you know, a teacher is responding to the classroom, to the students, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, in ways that are hopefully conveying effective pedagogical practices so the student learn. That's not a script. That's not the post office. So the challenge uh, is that as governments take what India, by and large, has been a quite successful country at policy making uh, in many domains, they've also been quite successful at logistics. Um, Every time I come to Delhi, I ride the Delhi Metro <laughs> to remind myself of the amazing capability the government of India can deploy when it's deployed to a specific task. When, you know, they built a metro, they, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> and so the problem, you know, in India is not that the government is failing, it's that the, the plan for building organizational capability ha has often assumed that you could extend capability building 
of the few elites and of the large body of other workers in ways that corresponded to one of these two things. And this emphasized the creation of expertise. This emphasized the, the, <laughs> the emphasis on understanding process and process compliance. But that same approach taken into these functions often fails badly. It fails very badly. Because if you attempt to take the process of teaching and learning and inculcate into teachers that they're automatons <laughs> who are expected to follow a strict script rather than that they're <laughs> valued independent autonomous professionals who are expected to achieve the outcomes by exercising professionalism, concern, and care, you can actually make things worse. So if you wonder why has India succeeded at putting every kid in school, but failed to create environments in those schools that produce the skills and competencies we demanded, I feel it is not that India hasn't devoted enough resources to it, it's that they have taken a logistics approach to an implementation intensive problem. So that's the, the <laughs> and if you think about, therefore, the challenge moving forward for India is how do we move the government from relatively successful policy making and relatively successful expansion of logistics. After all, it's an amazing accomplishment that nearly every child in India is in school. We don't want to minimize that, oh, well, we've failed. No, no, no. India succeeded. Nearly every child has the opportunity to go to school nearly everywhere in a huge, diverse, geographically challenging country. Building out that logistics was an amazing challenge that India has succeeded at. But the hardest thing to do is to recognize that the future requires different strategies than in the past. And that just doing more of what I did that succeeded in the past won't necessarily bring me the benefits I need for the future. So that's um, <clears throat> the second to last thing I want to say. The third thing I want to say is I want to lay out what I think, and I've worked with other researchers, what the strategy for capability looks like for implementation intensive public sector organizations. So I want to introduce to a potential alternative approach to building capability in public sector organizations that are responsible for implementation intensive things. Implementation intensive things means the agents need to correctly identify the, the facts to act on. They need to understand the specific context and what will be needed, and then they need to act correctly. And we have developed this with other authors, and because it's a program for governments to adopt, we've given it a four-letter acronym. Because we all know that governments only adopt things if they have a convenient acronym. Um, and so we call it P-D-I-A, and that stands for <laughs> Problem Driven, Iterative Adaptation. So, and this has, and the kind of, the motto of this is many approaches to building capability have again started from the idea that you can build the capability in the abstract and then later choose what you devote that capability to. So we're going to develop a generic athlete and then ask them to be a weightlifter without having trained them to be a weightlifter. Or we're going to develop a generic athlete and ask them to run a 100-yard dash without ever training them to run a 100-yard dash. Whereas our motto is, the, this approach <clears throat> is building capability by delivering results. <laughs> so.
So our view is if you want to build the capability to do something, the best way to build that capability is by doing it, by actually uh, identifying a challenge and overcoming that challenge. And in the process, you will learn both the obstacles and how to overcome them, and hence you will build capability. So this kind of approach has four kind of, this isn't a menu, <laughs> this is a set of principles. And like any set of principle, there's lots of ways to translate these principles into action. This isn't a, a directive of here's a easy step process, it's more here's, here's what successful approaches to building capability look like. First, <clears throat> they're around problems <laughs> that are what we call locally nominated. There's two key distinctions about what we mean by problem driven. The first is the opposite of that is solution driven. The easy approach that you can imagine you're going to prove organizations is by taking from off the shelf a solution, something Norway has done, something Japan has done, and you're going to take it and the leader of the organization is going to force the organization to adopt that solution. In which case, the adoption of the solution or the lack of the solution is seen as the problem. In which case, the only logic can be internally focused on process compliance. You're implementing the solution, but you never really understood exactly the context of the problem. So that's the first thing. It's problem driven, not solution driven. Many reforms are solution driven. We are going to adopt best practice. Well, <laughs> you know, the best practice for Finland might actually not be the best practice for Bihar. What we, uh, and so you often fail or you implement the solution without it ever checking whether the solution in this context is the problem or whether this solution is the solution to the problem. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that you have to work on locally nominated problems. You have to work on a problem that there's actually consensus that it's important to solve. And the consensus has to be pretty broad in the sense that in the space of public sector organizations, <laughs> you have political bosses. If your political apparatus doesn't want you to solve the problem, you can't solve the problem because the things you need to do to solve the problem aren't going to be carried out. So you need authorization. You need the political authorizing space to act. Second, you need acceptance. Organizations can change in certain ways and not others. It, it's not the case that organizations are kind of completely, they're not Plato. You can't just take an organization and mesh it up and make it into a new thing. It has certain ways of doing things. So what you want to do is say, what will, this, what will the large number of people I need the cooperation of to achieve successful uh, improvement, what are they willing to do? What can I convince them to do? Okay? And then the third thing you need is abilities. You need to build the abilities. So, so problem construction is actually the first and maybe hardest step to capability building. And it often gets completely skipped. You often come in to train people on the assumption that you have consensus about what the problem is. And what we find in our work is that often, <laughs> you know, they'll be about to start a program of implementation. And when you try and do the problem construction, it takes six months to actually go through the iterative process to find out what is it that people really are willing to work on to do and how do we create an adequate consensus to start. And, you know, if you don't start with a consensus of what, you know, a, a pretty shared vision of what does the world look like when this problem solved. You know, if, <laughs> if we're changing the 
commercial tax department to successfully implement the GST, we have to have a pretty clear vision of what does the world look like with adequate implementation of collecting the GST. And it's got to involve a little bit of making sure the revenue is collected and a little bit of making sure the citizens aren't overly harassed and a little bit of legal compliance, right? It has to involve multiple things, but you have to be able to articulate what does the world look like when I've solved the problem. The second <clears throat> is um, And this sounds, <laughs> I'm hoping that at least some things I'm saying sound a little crazy. Because if they don't sound a little crazy, they'll sound a lot like what you know. And why well, started from the big stuck. A lot of what you know must be wrong or would be further along on this than we write. So we should expect the solution to look significantly different than things we've tried in the past. So push positive deviance. What does that mean? What that means is, if you haven't solved this problem, it's because you haven't been able to successfully implement at scale the practices that solve the problem. If I want to do that, I have to have people try new things. I have to create space in which people who are willing to undertake new activities and new ways of solving the problem are authorized and enabled to act. So rather than start from the presumption that we know how to do it in the context at scale, you have to authorize positive deviation. We have to allow people to act in ways they haven't been allowed to act before to pursue solving the problem. Now, you obviously can't push positive deviance until you've concretely defined the problem and are able to measure progress on the problem. Because I, we can't just push deviance. Deviance is often what we have. Deviance is often our problem, but we have negative deviance. So, but the process control mentality tries to eliminate negative deviance and ends up also eliminating positive deviance. It's hard to be a good public civil servant because the rules stop you. <laughs> and frustratingly, the rules stop you from doing good things but those rules that were enabled to stop people from doing bad things don't stop the bad people from doing bad things, but they do stop the good people from doing good things. So we create organizations that limit the range of achievable practice, attempting to eliminate the bad, and paradoxically they're more successful at eliminating innovation and the good than they are at eliminating the bad. So we have to create an environment in which not the whole organization does whatever they feel like whenever they feel like it, but designated innovators are given space to act. So you promote positive deviance. Okay? The third step is <laughs> your first efforts will fail. <laughs> Nobody gets it right the first time, ever. And so the question is not will you fail? The answer is yes. The question is how quickly will you recognize that you're failing and change in a way that succeeds? So the third step is to iterate. That means a feedback loop. Iterate is a loop. We do something. Uh, you know, when, when we work with uh, groups attempting to implement this, we sometimes have frequent meetings. And we say, in the group that's attempting the positive deviance, what did you do? What happened? What did you learn? What are you going to do next? It's very simple, <laughs> but oftentimes, again, capability approaches that focus on progress compliance don't want to iterate. They don't build any space for iteration. We have decided what the policy is, and we decided your job is to do what we tell you to do, and that's it. And therefore, you've got no space, and iteration becomes unwelcome pushback. <laughs> So you need to build the space for positive devious iteration. And following iteration, you need to adapt. Um, the solutions to problems are always going to be granular. There's going to be lots of steps. If you take what even appears to be a simple thing, 
It's never simple. It involves lots of different elements, and like a puzzle, those pieces can only fit together in certain ways. And, you know, that requires that you try them out in lots of different ways until you find and then click. Those lock in and you gradually build out the puzzle. So you've adapted the orientation, that you've adapted what's being done by your, the positive deviance in response to the iteration. And then the last thing is you scale through diffusion. And, and what do we mean by that? Well, again, it's the opposite to how we do things with logistics. When we do logistics, <laughs> we scale by changing the process and insisting on process compliance. So it's a top-down expectation that we're going to change the behavior by command and control from the top down. With implementation, if you want a good police force, you're going to get a good police force when the policemen see that good policemen do it this way and not that way. Uh, I think one of the things about the process compliance mode versus what we're suggesting, and this is the last thing I'll say, is that governments have often assumed that if things are failing, we need to tighten controls, right? But as a metaphor, <laughs> you don't make Pinocchio into a real boy by adding more strings. Pinocchio is a puppet, and if he only has two strings, he can only do some things. If you add four strings, he can do more things, but he's still a puppet. And implementation success doesn't come from more articulated puppets. It comes from human beings acting with concern and care. So one of the things is that rather than thinking of accountability being primarily a being about accounting, where we've reduced each step to a specific concrete process compliance tax e task and or reporting of a specific compliance with a procedure or a specific input, we want to shift to account-driven accountability. What's an account? An account is a narrative that I tell about who I am and what I did and why what I did was the right thing. So you're going to have a good police force when policemen tell a narrative about who they are as policemen that is consistent with practices that achieve excellent policing. You're not going to turn policemen into puppets. You're not going to turn doctors into puppets. You're not going to turn teachers into puppets. You're going to turn them into people who are actively pursuing purposes to solve problems that they have a shared stake in, and you're going to enable them to search out effective ways. And once those effective practices are discovered, they're diffused through the organization in ways that allow people to, ad to, <laughs> to essentially change their behavior because they see that behavior is more consistent with their values. That's the way you're going to create a successful organization that accomplishes important public purposes. And that's, if you say, this is hard, exactly it's hard. That's why it hasn't been done yet. If you say, that's not the way we've done things in the past, exactly. <laughs> it's different than the way you did things in the past. Because in the past, you were solving logistical problems, which needed to be solved, but at the expense of deepening the capability of the Indian state. So I feel India has been enormously successful to date, <laughs> but the challenges that face the end of the future are going an entirely new approach to building the capability of the organizations inside the public state to carry out the important core functions that need to happen to improve the well-being. And I think this or approaches like this are going to be the key to building state capability. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.